All right, awesome. We are live. I'm just going to go ahead and try to get us shared here. Make sure we are everywhere we need to be. There you go. Carlo, how's the weather down there? The weather is wonderful. It is fabulous. Um, ready to go to the beach today. Oh, ready. I would love to. <laughs> I wish I wish I could go. I, I want to go to the beach. That's what I, yes. It, when I tell you it's nice, it is nice. Awesome. Awesome. Sorry, I'm looking over here at my second screen and, you know, I am not a techie. So you have to forgive me because sometimes it takes me a minute to like get myself again. And let me stop saying I'm not a techie. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a young techie. What is there it? You go. Uh, what is it in Star? Was it Star Star, Star Wars or whatever the the um what is the it? Trekkie? The tricky? Not the 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 small ones. The padwans. The little the babies that they're training to become Jedi's. Whatever. I'm a padwan when it comes to technology. I'm not a Jedi. <laughs> I'm not a Jedi. Right. You know what I'm saying? My I, son knows all that. I asked him I, the advice. I was about to say I birthed the Jedi, but. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm like, what? What's that? No, I, you know, what I'm saying, I still got uh, ways to go with that. So I am um, just looking here. To see, we'll get started and kick off in just a few seconds here. Um, but you're in the upstate, so have you guys gotten? You're like in the upstate, right, or close, like the Midlands, Midlands type area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any snow this season? Mm, yeah, but it was a flyby snow. I mean, it was just like, like usually we get to play in the snow and everything. Not the snow. Oh, that's mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about that life. Um, <laughs> playing in the snow is like not my thing, and I'm in the New England area, but you won't catch me playing in the snow. Like I can't do it. I can't oh, yeah. do it. I have no desire. But I will say, I am one of those people that will post up and look out the window. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you got the, the the hot cup of cocoa. For me, it's tea. I love tea. I have so much tea here. So I even oh, I love tea too. I'm oh, a tea drinker too. Girl, yes, honey. That tea will do it for me. I'm just like, I will invest in the tea. So, you know, I'll post up with my little mug and I have my tea. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it's so pretty. But I don't want it touching <laughs> me and I don't want to touch it. And I'm 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 good to go. I'm really good to go. So, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. So hi everyone, welcome back to Kingdom Kinesis where we inspire women to action through partnership with God, self and community. Um, trials are guaranteed in this life, but pain doesn't have to stifle you. Personal tragedy can fuel purpose and call us to action as we all know, right? Hopefully. And this week's guest author, poet, singer, songwriter, dramatist, motivational speaker, the list can go on. Carla Lachelle Dawson is no stranger when it comes to finding the silver lining when dark clouds arise. Carla is here to share her story of hope and inspiration as a loving mother to both an angel and a rainbow baby. So Carla, I am so excited to have you here today. Thank you for joining us, LS. Thank you for having me, LS. Um, I am just ecstatic to be here and be a part of your ministry, um, be a part of what God has called you to do. I am just so proud of you. And um, there's nowhere I'd rather be today. Oh. So, yes, everything Blessing. has aligned. Everything has aligned. Amen. We bless God for that. We thank him for that. So, um, you know, I'm all about being nosy. So I'm going to ask you, but no, for a good, for, in a good way, for a good purpose here. Right. So tell us, you know, tell us a little about yourself. Well, um, my name is on the screen. It's Carla Lachelle Dawson. Um, so that is not a stage name. That is really my name, named after my father, uh, named Carl. And um, he wanted a boy and I'm not a boy, but I'm here. Um, and I act a lot like him, so they say. Um, so I, I am really from a small town, Darlington, South Carolina, but I live outside of Charlotte and Rock Hill. And I am the mother of, I'm the first time uh, I'm a wife. Um, and I am a mother of one angel in heaven and two children on earth. Um, I have a 12 year old. And oh, I'm sorry, she's a teenager. I have a 13 year old, she just turned 13, um, and a 10 year old. And, um, you know, I just where God uses me and what He wants me to do, I really try to be obedient. So, um, as you said, I'm an educator, uh, for approximately 20 years, um, and I 
currently teach creative writing and journalism and um, English. And um, I am also an author. I have uh, three books and I am a musician and a songwriter. I have an album. Yeah. And um, I do storytelling. Um, you know, I do storytelling. I go to schools and libraries and I'm a, uh, what they would call a historic reenactor. Oh, um, OK. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I love historic reenactments yes. with a civil war. and You got everybody dressed up. And there you go. You so I can, yeah, okay. I can step in the character any moment. So, yeah. So. Um, that's a little bit about me. I love my community. I'm very active in the community, um, community um, activists. And yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me. I love to laugh um, yeah. and I, <laughs> I love to write. I'm, I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Sorority Incorporated. Um, so yeah, I, lo I love to laugh and I love God. I love God. Hey, amen. So that's that's so much like all of that packed in that one little <laughs> teeny tiny body of yours that's a whole <laughs> lot like that's a whole powerhouse you said it like it's nothing like you were mutant you were born that way you're like i'm born soup soup you know souped up like that but but we, we really are because we become think about it when we enter into god's well we, we have god's grace but when we make a decision to make christ our savior and we receive salvation we are new creatures for real so why not that's be that souped up why not be that great you know, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have access to all that greatness. And I can see like God is definitely, you know, you are manifesting. Let me say that you have partnered with yourself in manifesting that greatness and going out here and making moves. So I have a question for you because mm -hmm. I I know I think I've seen a few things on your website um, or pictures where you were in character. But who is your <laughs> favorite? Like, who is your favorite? I got my little notebook here with my questions. But who is your favorite um, person or historical figure to reenact? Oh, a historical figure. Yes. Okay. I, I would say it's very easy for me to be, um, I would say it's very easy for me to be Harriet Tubman because she was my, my first, um, my first, uh, I would say, uh, historian that I embodied, but I like playing Coretta Scott King. Oh, mm -hmm. I always, I even have a doll named Coretta. Okay. So <laughs> When I was little, I had a dog named Coretta. That was my baby. And I always loved Coretta Scott King. Um, I always, I don't know, I could always envision her role. And the more I read about her and um, how she was active in even um, bringing about um, MLK Day, because it wouldn't have happened without her. Um, I just love playing her. And she's so dignified. Yeah. You know, so I am Coretta Scott King. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. That go man, ahead. I met this man on the campus and he was, can I tell you? Short. <sighs> he was the first thing I saw with him was he was so short. And I thought I can never date him because I am Coretta. But the more we went out, I, the brother had it going on. I mean, he had degrees upon degrees. And I, even though I was a singer and I actually would sing all across the nation, that's what I was going to school for, to the conservatory. Did you know that? And so I met Martin and we raised a family, a beautiful family of children. And life was hard, but it was great. We made a sacrifice for our nation. See, people don't understand. There were death threats. So much happened. But I, I knew I was there with him. I walked with him. I marched with him. And when he died, I carried the torch. I carried his legacy. Woo! Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Coretta. Go ahead, Coretta. So she is my favorite. Because without her, it you know we wouldn't know about it. We would not know about it. But she kept his legacy going. And when and a lot of people don't think about with our nation, um, you know, people really didn't like Martin because he. I mean, um, yeah, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because of what he stood for. But it's now that we're on the right side of history, we do it. So. Yes, Coretta Scott King. She's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you two are so well. You embody it. I, I like how you went into character. You know, I was just like, well, go ahead, girl. <laughs> so I know, I, I know, you know, we're laughing, but honestly, I mean, 
all of these talents that you have, I'm sure you've had some major accomplishments to date. I'm not saying any of the other accomplishments or any of the other roles that you have aren't accomplishments as well. But with regards to like your poetry, your uh, songwriting, uh, singing, um, motivational speaking, etc., you know, what are some of your biggest accomplishments to date? Ooh, well, is that you know what I would say? It's been a journey getting to this place because um, I majored in biology for three years for my undergraduate degree, and um, I don't know, just perceived expectations. Um, I would say my biggest accomplishment is following my heart um, because I felt like you know others would say when I told my family and I told others. I, I want to go to school and I think I'm and, and then I heard about oh you can go to school for a few years and be a physical therapist I was like yes that's for me and um, I went I remember in high school I was a part of like a program a health science program and I worked at the hospital and um, and I was just like I'm gonna do it and then when I get I was at college I would take the classes and but I was more interested in everything else in the gospel choir in in the um, the um, dance truth and the yeah, yeah. Um, Afro American studies pro programs. I was that was like oh that's me, and so I really had to. Um, I remember one day I was on my way home from college and I was driving home. It takes two hours to get home from Charleston to Darlington, and um, I said, God, what do you want me to do? You know, mm. I know that I am not always. In, I don't always do right. You know. But Lord, what do you want me to do? And he literally, as I was driving home, he literally, it was like um, pictures almost or, or a, a movie, but he, he yeah. flashed across. It was like a screen. It's, and I could see everything I had done as a child with writing and singing and, and dancing. And, and, and I could see the writing. And I said, I have to change my major. So in my in my third year, I changed my major to, um, to English. Um, and I had to take five and six courses a semester. And um, I would say that's probably my biggest accomplishment because it was not the popular thing to do. I had to spend an extra semester in school and um, it, and it's taken a while to kind of unravel what I've what I try to do on my own, if that makes mm, sense, without right, God's right. with God without God's prompting. And so I would say no matter how hard it's been to continue to follow the path. Um, I just try, I would say to me, that is my biggest, biggest accomplishment, still trying to follow what God wants me to do. Um, mm. Even when it doesn't seem popular or right to, to those around me. Um, so even as a teacher, when things don't fit in that box, when people say, oh, you're a teacher. I say, oh, I'm a teacher and I'm a writer and I'm a, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and so I just try to follow what, what God has for me. And I, I would say to me, that's probably the, the biggest accomplishment. Now I've met some people. Um, well, who journey. you done met, girl? Who you done met? I know you met Felicia Rashad, but I ain't gonna, I, I'm going to let you say it. I ain't going to say it. But who <laughs> who I did met? get to meet her. I did. And it was an honor. I mean, who doesn't love um, Miss Cosby? Okay. You know, um, but, um, you know, that it was, it, now I tell you, that was God. So I um, I actually am the chair of, well, I'm the, hmm, I, I am a past chair of Juneteenth Rock Hill. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was able to be a part of the Juneteenth board and I was the chair at, um, at one time. And, and, um, and so being a part of that board, I, I realized and this was like six years ago. And, um, a lot of people didn't know about Juneteenth. I would talk to adults. I would talk to children. They didn't know. And so I wrote a book about Juneteenth. I actually have it right here. It's called, um, why do we celebrate the rich legacy of Juneteenth? And my husband didn't know. But he is my um, that he was going to be my illustrator. But he draws so well, and so he's the illustrator. Oh, I want y'all to see this. I love I love his artwork. Hold that. So, do it again, Carlo. In slow motion. Do it in slow motion. You gotta let us see it for a little bit. Let's see the other page too, Carlo. Like the okay. other, look at that. Oh, All right. And then I need you to school the people too. Sara Tawana Hayes is in the house. Hey Tawana. Hey Tawana. Um, but Carlo, school the people real quick on Juneteenth and what it is. And that we all know that's Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. So um, Juneteenth is the commemoration of the ending of slavery. So um, in Galveston, Texas. Um, and so, of course, the enslaved Africans, um, by way of the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, we would think in America that um, 
the enslaved were free. However, um, the um, enslaved Africans in Galveston, Texas, didn't find out until two years later um, by a proclamation from um, Colonel Granger, who came to um, the plantation and, and shared, hey, this is what the Emancipation Proclamation says. And so um, it was on June 19th, that's why it's called Juneteenth. Um, and so by way of that, um, they started dancing and playing you know, banjos and they had their barbecue, you know, and uh, just like we do, just like we do, that's, yeah. we do it like our ancestors. And they yelled Jubilee, Jubilee. And, um, and so that tradition continued. And through years it was, it, you know, people tried to bury it, but Texas has really been instrumental in that. And, um, and so of course with social media, I would say in the last year, people really did um, highlight um, Juneteenth a lot, but it had really been where people didn't really know what it was. And so um, so I wrote a book about it. And um, at one of the Juneteenth events um, in Rock Hill, we at, I, I was selling my books, but also, you know, I was, I think I was host of the event and someone had come over to the table and he actually said, we would love for you to come and share your book. Now people have asked me to share this book. And I, like I said, I go to libraries and schools and you know, I, I, like I said, I become the characters. Um, I even become little Lillian on the plantation. And let's talk about plantation life. And and so I'm used to that. So I was like, okay, great. Um, when I went there, well, the first year, you know what? I didn't do it the first year. Okay. And even, and, and I didn't do it. it. They asked me to go to a place called Brainerd Institute in Chester, South Carolina. And I didn't do it because I had, um, promised like four places that was coming. And I said, I have to honor my word. Um, and the, the next year I said, I promise you I will go. And the next year when I went, I did my storytelling and everything. And my children, I, I try to take them with me because I said, God gave them to me. They're on this journey with me and we, we have a good time. And so they went with me and and at the end of the, um, they ate, they wanted to eat, they were hungry. So so they ate with the children who were there and we made a big quilt and they said, it's Felicia Rashad's birthday. We're gonna make her a quilt um, because the the director of, well, the um, founder of, of the Brainerd Institute um, Open Fields is Dr. Vivian Ayers Allen, who is Felicia Rashad's mother. Okay. And- wow. So I just thought I was, and I had I met her. Oh, she's honey. You can you when you meet her, you know why they De, Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad. You know why they are who they are. Okay, okay? just oh, just regal. And so um, I thought that you know I I would just make, help make the quilt with the children, and that would be it. I took my pictures, but as I was doing it, they said, "There she is." I said, "There she is." <laughs> and um, and so. They had had me to um, sign the quilt as the author. They asked me to sign the quilt and present it to her. And so I did, and I gave her a signed copy of the book, and and um, and we took pictures together. And um, I just, you know, she thanked me for being there with her mother, and she took pictures of me with her mother. And and I, I'll tell you, I I felt like God honored me because I didn't just you know, say, I, I I didn't leave the other, that event the year before. I didn't leave. You know right, what I mean? Right, 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 right. I honored even, because I was, I was happy that it was Dr. Vivian Ayers Allen, because she's a poet. Mm. And, um, and so I felt drawn to her, but I just felt like this is God. And I will tell you, even in that moment when she, when, when uh, Felicia Rashad was taking pictures of me, you see how the enemy will try to creep in. Um, I remember saying, why is she taking pictures of me? Mm. Ooh. You know, and I told my mom, and she said, "Why not? Why not? Yeah." And I, I said, "You know what, mom? You are right. Why not?" And I right. said, "That tells you where God will take you. Your your gift will make room for you." Amen. Um, so when I say I feel like um, the biggest biggest accomplishment I made was following my heart, right? Um, I really do feel. I really do feel like that. Right, right, because it's taking you some places and also taking you to NPR as well, correct? Was it NPR that you were um, on or public? The BBC. The, the BBC. BBC, that's it. It was the BBC, that's right. Yeah. But still, the BBC is a nice place <laughs> to be, honey. Let the BBC call me. Yes. Yes. Would you like me on the show? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yep, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. 
and you were on BBC for the book as well, right? For Juneteenth. It yeah, it was it was for the book. So as a part of being the chair of Juneteenth, I had um I had done a documentary, and really, you know what's crazy is sometimes we think we have to move somewhere really big, and I'm in this I am in a, in a smaller town, you right. know. Right. Um, and so God is just, you know, he'll open doors. I think when you step out on faith and do what Amen. he calls you to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, being the chair, I had done a documentary um, for South Carolina um, ETV. And um, actually the, the, um, the when the woman, actually when the reporter called me, I thought this cannot be real. Because first she emailed me. And you know, when you get all these emails, I was like, this is not real. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, I was like, yeah. BBC. So I went and Googled her, of course. That's what we do. So I Googled yes, her. Yes, yes. And I said, let me just entertain it and call her. So um, I called her and I loved her accent. Hello, hello. You know, and um, I'm with the BBC. And I said, <laughs> I was like, is this real? So I said, you know what? If she, if she calls me back, I'll entertain it. So I, I got everything ready and she called me back. We um, and she she did the interview and I thought, oh, my God. So she she really wanted to talk about Juneteenth in America, you know, I because la like I said, last year, there was so much with Black Lives Matter. And I think with the Black Lives Matter, people have really um, that that's like our holiday, you know, our Independence Day, um, Juneteenth. And so they wanted to know about it in Great Britain. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, how does it impact America? Um, and so, you know, interestingly, I was speaking on behalf of <laughs> America, America. And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, and sharing Juneteenth in America. And then they wanted me to share about the book and the inspiration behind my book. So I was like, okay, you know, okay, God, um, have your way. So, yeah. Have your way. I love that. Um, a few people in the chat here. Tawana said hello, ladies. Uh, hi, Henrietta. Sir. I know, right? Henrietta Hickman says hi, Carlo. Hi, hi Auntie. And then hi, Auntie. And then Margie Goodson also said, "That's right. Why not? That's right. Your mama was speaking." That's my mother. Not. That's my mother. Oh, That's exactly what she said. Goodson. Yep. Yes, Miss Goodson. You're so right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to. I want to talk about something you said. It was so important. You said when you were driving that day, because um, you know I've always. I remember you started off as a, a, a STEM major, but I, I also recall the last time we talked, I said, you know, that one night we were on the phone and I said, Carlo, just seemed like you weren't really ever psyched <laughs> about it. If you were never <laughs> psyched about it, um, you just were never psyched and you write. I remember you being a gospel choir. I remember you singing. I remember you always wanting to have your, your, your hands in the art somehow, right? But you said yeah. something that was so um, important. You said when you were driving, you asked one question, you were like, God, what do you want me to do? And in an instant, he showed you yourself. He showed you who you were at your core. And That's for right. some reason you were so, you know, we, you were stuck, Not, I don't wanna say stuck, but you were um, focused on the decision you had already made and that path that was set out, right? Cause we all know there's a curriculum, you gotta meet, you gotta pass the courses and then That's you get right. the degree, right? And God's like, no, let me show you who you are in your at your core i'm not worried about this curriculum and it reminds me of the prodigal son who was in a situation he was very unhappy and and, and you know it was brought to his remembrance like wait a minute the servants eat better than this like my father is like the man what am i mm -hmm. doing here i am unhappy <laughs> and so you made that decision to be obedient you made a decision to do what was unpopular, meaning, you know, I got to take five or six classes a semester now. I have to stay an extra semester. But you were on the right path that's led to great opportunities. And it's important how, you know, you recognize and you acknowledge the fact that your opportunities came in a small place. You said, I'm in a small town, but it doesn't matter when you are doing what God has called you to do. Your gifts will make room for you. And as long as you're open and obedient, you will be where you need to be. Like I, my one of my prayers is to be at the right place at the right time all the time. And the only way that can happen is when we truly open ourselves up to the voice of God and leaning on that. So I want to thank you for pointing that out. That's awesome, Sora. That's so good right there. Now I got to keep moving us forward because you know, girl, we'll start going. Um, <laughs> we'll start going. I'm trying to calm down now. Um, but you know, I know all of these these amazing things have happened, and there've also been a few other things that have happened throughout your life that has informed your work. You mentioned you're a wife, you're a mom. Um, with the latter presenting some personal tragedy for you, that has informed your work. Can you share with us what happened? 
Well, you know, uh, so I, it's, you know, I, I was married, and um, so my husband and I felt like it was, you know, time. Oh. It was time, and um, you know, we really try to do what a lot of people say. We're going to try to wait for the right time. Um, you know, have a, a a year or two just us, you know, traveling. We did, and then we felt like it was time, and and uh, we had no problem conceiving. Um, you know, we were pregnant, and then I was really long, uh, really late in my um, in my pregnancy. It was my last trimester, and um, I, I remember I remember now, but at the time I didn't. Um, I was actually at a poetry slam, and I remember feeling something different, but I just really thought the baby was moving. We had we had gone the day before, and and we um, saw the baby moving, active, happy. And then, no, no, we had gone like some months, a uh, one month before the movie baby was moving and active. And then the next day, it was actually time for my um, my ultrasound. And um, you know, my husband, he was so good. He was you know so ready. I always wanted to be a dad. Wanted to be a good dad. And um, we knew we were having a boy. We had named him Kay mm-hmm. Dawson. And we went to the ultrasound. And um, I remember looking at the um, the screen. And I remember, I can see it like a movie. That's why I actually wrote a book called, uh, a, a poem called Circles. because And I set it up like a movie because I could, uh, I could see it like a movie. Um, I remember the ultrasound technician she stopped and I looked because I said, oh, my God, he's so still today. He's always so active. Why is he not moving? All right. Uh, I, can you get me some? Hey, excuse me. Can you give me some Kleenexes, please? Sorry. I had to tell my son, go ahead and get the Kleenex because I feel it's coming. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry about Look, that. Go ahead. I have I feel it coming. I know. I feel and, it coming. <laughs> and she left out abruptly. And when she um, left out, the doctor came in and she said, I'm sorry, Miss um, Dawson, your baby does not have a heartbeat. And um, and uh, we just I remember I remember the, the 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 screams just we both screamed and yelled and I said why God why and uh, my husband he held me we just cradled each other and I and you know what's interesting for some reason I looked at the doctor I don't even know why but I looked at her and she had tears in her eyes as well and. Um, and so yeah, we had lost a baby, and I remember we we cried and cried, and then the doctor came back in. She left out, and she came back in, and she said, "Okay, Miss Dawson, you're going to have to figure out what to do." Yeah. And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "You can't keep that baby in you because it will um, infect you." Right. And I remember being angry at her because I said, "How dare you say my baby will infect me?" Mm-hmm. And um, so I, so she said, you're going to have to either deliver this baby today or tomorrow. And she said, you're going to have to deliver it because you're too far along. And it is a baby. And I remember I told my husband, I can't do this. I need my mom and daddy. <laughs> I remember saying, I need my mom and daddy. And, I, and he said, okay, okay. I cannot do this myself. So. Yeah, we had to deliver the baby um, the next day. Oh, wow. Okay. So- and it was my first experience, you know. <laughs> yes, and a, an experience that you and your husband were looking forward to. You had planned. You were ready. Um, in your minds, the timing um, was right. What you, you said in that moment you reacted, uh, you you remember processing some of the, the some of the the thoughts that you had, or just some of what the doctor said. You know, feeling like you know, because in your mind you're processing the you're, you're experiencing the grief, not even processing. You're experiencing the grief, and then you're having to be told <clears throat> you have to let go of the thing that you love mm-hmm. because it could harm you, and you have to you're for you you're forced to make a decision at that point in time because a doctor's job is, you know, their job is science, right? Their job is right. science, and and you um your 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 health and your life was priority for her what what happens next you 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 go through the process of having the child you you do what needs to be done to move forward medically but what's going on with you 
mentally and emotionally now that that has transpired and we we've moved on to you know birthing your first child where are we now uh guilt beyond guilt you know i thought if i wasn't at the school working if i wasn't hosting a poetry slam if i wasn't moving i literally thought you know it, i just shouldn't have moved mm. um mm. if i wasn't <laughs> exercising you know i was just thinking anything you know and that is my fault because my job is to protect my baby right. and and i didn't do it and so i had guilt beyond guilt i wanted to take my own life mm. um you know i thought why me i would i i was very angry at god very angry um and I felt like my body betrayed me, mm. you know, because I didn't, I had no idea that when I would lose my baby, my body would do everything that it does when you have a baby. Like I was like, my body is producing milk, you know? So my body did all the things that happens when you deliver a baby, but I was like, I have no baby. And um, so I remember being very angry at God, being angry, and, and I just think about all the emotions I went through, being angry at anyone who had a baby and being angry at myself and being angry at people who had a baby. Um, so I was angry at myself, disappointed at myself, being disappointed because I was angry at God. Like there was just every emotion. And um, we actually made a decision, my husband and I, we we had a memorial for my son, uh, my son, um, you know, but also I was angry at myself for not like my parents had never had a grandchild and he was going to be a son. So I was angry that I didn't give them that. You know, I was just angry. Um, and I, I went into a place of numbness. I was just numb and angry. I couldn't I had cried so much. I couldn't cry anymore. You so know? you were like on automatic, basically just I wake up. I do this. I do X. I do Y and Z. And then I go back to sleep. And the next day I do X, Y and Z and I go back to sleep. What, how did you get, because you said something so important. You said, you know, you were, you were, you felt guilty about what had happened. Then you felt guilty about feeling bad and guilty. And then you mm -hmm. also had, you know, some suicidal ideations. How did you process those thoughts? How did you move beyond saying, okay, I'm not going to take my life. That is not an option. How do you get, how did you get through those moments? The, the only thing I knew to do was to lean on what I had always leaned on before. So I, when I was bullied as a child, I read my Bible and I wrote poems. I wrote in my journal and I said, that got me through and I'm going to need that. I'm, I'm going to need whatever that whatever that was. I, I need to go back to that because I remember I had lost my taste to write. I remember being a teacher in the students. You know, when you're a, a teacher, the students who when you're pregnant, they feel like that's their baby. And um, and, and I don't I went back to work soon. And um, but I was angry and I cried all the time at work. But those kids, they 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 helped me. And. Um, even now they're, they're, those students are adults now. And they always say, I remember our baby. Um, but all I knew to do was, I said, I need to write. And so I just wrote and wrote in my journal because I said, the things that I'm feeling, I don't feel that they're right. There, at the time there wasn't any book because, um, that was in 2006 and there weren't really many books. Um, and so I said, all I know to do is to write in my journal. I said, because I don't know if these feelings are right, <laughs> you know, um, to want someone else's baby. And, 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 and the sad part is I could identify with every single person. Like I said, oh, that person kidnapped that baby. Like my brain was thinking, I could understand why they want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. You know, like there were these thoughts and I said, they can't be right. So all I knew to do was to write in my journal. And um, as I wrote my journal, it was cathartic for me. Um, and um, and then eventually I did go to a, a counselor. But I think the best thing was writing in my journal. And I said, God, I know I feel angry. I need you to just give me the time to feel angry. Mm -hmm. And I felt like he did. And, and I started thinking about people in the Bible who were angry. And I right. felt like he gave me the time to be angry. 
And I, I, you know, it's so interesting that when you have the Holy Spirit, right? Because when you don't know what to say, he makes intercessions for you. He, he's there. He can, he can, you know, translate what's being said and get it up to the heavens where it needs to go. But mm -hmm. you, you said that, you know, you, you would have these thoughts, you were angry, but you were still, how can I say this? Mature in your faith enough to understand that you could still go back to the, the same father that allows you to feel this hurt and say, I don't want to be angry because the scriptures say, be angry, but sin not. So we're not going to take someone else's child. We're not going to, you know, Correct. lash out at everyone who has what we, what we want ourselves, but still just the goodness of God resting upon you and the Holy spirit within you that drew you back to God himself and something that he gave you as part of your core identity, which was the gift of writing and the ability to put your thoughts out on paper. Go ahead, sis, what were you about to say? No, I was gonna say at the time it didn't feel, it didn't yeah. feel right. You know? yeah. yeah, Think back on it and, and you do the best you can, um, you know, and, and I, I definitely had my family and I had my husband, but you know, it's, it's where people don't know what to say and, and how would they, you know? How, how would you really know what to say? <laughs> right. um, I always tell people, be there, you know, be there and, and just be there to hug and hold the person. Um, and that's the best thing to say, because it's hard to know what to say and when to say it. Um, but at the time, I, I didn't know if it was right or not. All I knew was, Lord, I, I just I just got to go to what you gave me and use um, what you've given me. And, and that's all I can do. You know, I love it. I love it. I got to go to what you gave. Girl, I got to write that down. <laughs> to what you gave me it's simple but it's very profound because mm -hmm. sometimes we're looking for these fixes that are elaborate and beautiful and, and contained in a book you're looking for knowledge you said there's no there's no book on this i'm looking for knowledge and god's like <laughs> right yeah, right right and god's like i need you to go you know what you say i need you to, to go uh to what was it look okay, okay hold on lord uh this is when you can't read your own writing. This is horrible. What'd you say, Lord? I need you. I need to go to what's what I've I went, always done. I've known. I went to what, what he's known. what he had always given me to yeah, do, and, and the tools that um, he had always given me. Right, you, you know? went to what, what he had always always given you to do, which was inherent to who you are and how he made you. And that mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love the fact that you're honest about that, and that. It's it's very simple. You don't have to go looking for these big fixes or these elaborate fixes. Um, real quick, your father is in the house. We honor you, Mr. Good San Carlo. Has never been afraid of anything. Her self confidence is her superpower. To quote Blake Morrison, her reliance on God is her Holy Ghost power. He also says, <laughs> grandfathers seldom cry when they need to be strongest for their daughter. Silent tears, it seems now, can only be heard by God. And he says, we remember our baby. So please tell your father hello. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. But I, I am I am afraid a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I am always, I am afraid of that. Yo, you are your daddy's child, I see, for sure. <laughs> you said it right. I I see, all the words, all the words. I see all the words. I love it. So eloquently written. Like, it's just, I'm like, okay, I see you. Um, So back to this, because you began to do the writing and whatnot, but it was a call of, uh, to, to action because from out of that sprang a ministry. And that ministry, you know, is supported by your gifts for writing, etc. How do we get there? Well, you know, it, it is interesting because and before I had conceived, my husband and I conceived my um, firstborn, um, we, I, I was writing, you know, I was writing, I met him, I was like, babe, you know, watching Love Jones, you know, I was like, I was like, I'm a poet, you know, and I said, I always wanted to have a poetry book and I always wanted to write music and um and so I was like, I'm going to write music. He was like, okay. So I, I wrote songs. And uh, one, of, one of our classmates, um, her name was June Nixon at the time. She was like, my husband's a producer. You want to do music? Okay. So I had gone. Um, so we went up there and I, 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 I recorded three songs. You know, I was like, I'm going to step out on faith, God. I believe it, God. And so, and I did. I mean, I did it. And then, and then I lost my son. And I lost the taste to write. I lost the taste for everything. And I heard God say, right, keep writing, keep writing. Even though I had lost the taste, he said, come on now, that's not you. And so um, I had, I said, okay. 
But I have written, and my dad can tell you, I, I have written this um, album, The Book of My Revelation. So, you know, um, because it's all about, it's my daughter, because it's all about me learning who I am, a revelation and my relationship with the Bible. But, you know, it's a little bit of everything on there. It's, it's soulful music, you know, make uh -huh, you feel uh -huh. good. And I wrote a song on there, Only God Knows, because it was a, it was a poem originally that I had written for my son my firstborn son, and I had written it for him. And also I was thinking that, you know, it says, oh, what happened, sweet angel? Why did you have to go? Oh, what happened, sweet angel? Um, only God knows, you know, because I'm not in control. And I, I had a prayer in there too. God, if you're listening, um, and I know that you are, you know, I know that you are. Wrap me in your arms and wrap me in your love. You know, and so I wrote this first and I released it and I released it when my um, my uh, when my daughter and my son, they were little. Um, my son was maybe one. My daughter was three. I released it. And then I felt like there's something about those poems that I wrote and somebody and throughout the years, people needed those. It was like I was giving advice to people. Um, you know, I had lost my son and now it's been about 16 years ago. But throughout the years, people needed what I needed. And I thought, I know that they're feeling what I'm feeling. I know that they feel like, why am I feeling these thoughts? And I wanted them to know that they're not alone in their thoughts. And I wanted them to have what I didn't have. And so I went back to my journal where I had written all these emotions, you know, all these things. And I was in, my, in a grad school class and it was a poetry class. Mm. And I realized I was crying all through the poetry class. I was just writing them, writing extra poems. And um, I said, I'm going to turn this into a book for women to know and families to know you are not alone. And everything that you're feeling is normal. And it's better for you to write it out instead of acting on it. Mm. And so I had written the book, Semblance of a Footprint, because when I held my uh, firstborn, he couldn't even make a footprint. You know, so I, I always say semblance of a footprint, but always an imprint in my heart. And um, so literally the, the poems in here were from my diary and me being a writing teacher. I said, I'm going to challenge myself and write a few more and I'm going to write them in different styles so that anybody could feel like um, they could write it. Because I said writing is so important. It was so important to me that I basically. Um, have with their poems, but also a place where people can write within it themselves um, and scriptures as well. Um, so I try to just give them what I felt like I needed and just to know that your feelings are valid. What you feel is natural. Uh, so yeah, so that's how it started with Semblance of a Footprint. And then I said, I'm gonna start a group as well. And so I've started a, a um, I, well, let me say, I didn't start the ministry. God started the ministry. I started this ministry a long time ago because <laughs> I was talking to these women in private because they would call me. I said, just call me. If you have a problem, call me. I said, I know where you're coming from. I understand. And so they would talk to me in private. And that's why I wrote a poem about people talking to me in private. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, I'm going to start this group so that we can actually have that family and make it official. You know, just put the stamp on what God had already done. But I would love to read that poem about that I based on people just talking to me in private. That's okay. Let's do it, please. Let's see. And and I, one of the reason I want to read it too is we're sorority sisters, so I think you'll catch some of the um, innuendo in it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So I always tell people, you know, get ready for your snaps at the end. Okay. All right. All right. It's called the secret. I'm a part of a secret society. Our colors do not consist of pink, green, crimson, cream, red, gold, blue, or white. Right Nor does it include pulled bra straps, ear tugs, or secret handshakes. The sorority does not call to her sister ski week or ooh. There are no hand size raised in proclamation, wooden pe pledge pins, or insignia borne upon our chest. But our heads hang low and lurk in shamed silence. Still, I'm a part of a secret society. The profites have not initiated me, but
but I've been hazed far beyond one week. We've all been hazed, crossed our bloody sands and felt the burly whip of loss, of emptiness, of bruised theft. I hear my sorrows chant in whispered despair. I've been there too. I've lost one too. Forever hazed by the loss of what felt most precious, a child. The women bear their secret in their hearts. A lifelong pledge to stay strong against a world of mothers uninitiated and ignorant foots and mouths saying, maybe you'll have twins next time. And something must have been wrong with that baby. God will give you a better baby next time. Yes, I know you don't want to join this sorority. I never even thought I would be initiated, but we do exist. We are out here and maybe even sitting next to you, but shh, don't tell anybody. Carlo. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. I, 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 brilliant. Um, was that one of the first poems that you wrote in your journey or had that come along after you had pretty much like, I don't want to say coached, but counseled and ministered to other women? It came along afterwards because I realized that, you know, I would have so many people say, I lost the baby too. Oh, it's all right. I never told anybody, but I did too. And I was like, why are we ashamed of something that we don't, we can't control this, you know? Right. We don't know when it's gonna happen. We don't know how it's gonna happen. Um, all we, you know, but I think all of us felt like our body betrayed us and society kept looking down of us on us, like maybe you should have been, you know, maybe you should have done it, sit down somewhere, you know. But I mean, me being a high school teacher, I mean, you know, you often see pregnant students and they're doing all kinds of stuff, you know. So my husband would always say to me, babe. It's not that you were doing something wrong because you were healthy as I don't know what. It just was the way that God wanted it. And that's such a bitter pill to swallow, mm. but it is. So yeah, this was um this was created after that, you know, after many times of people saying that to me. And I was thinking, why why have we been so ashamed as women, you know? It's a, a few things here that I want to point out. Um, and thank you for sharing that. I and, and Ewan Nikki Moore Hawkins. Uh, hi, sis. How you doing? She says powerful. Uh, Henrietta Hickman says real with the exclamation mark as well. It was. It's a powerful poem. It's so good, especially uh, being Greek. I, I it, it just hits home for me. I'm um, in so yeah. many ways, and I I, I just want to point a few things out that you didn't bring a, draw attention to, but I want to point it out because you've said it now. Mind you, you just referenced that your son was maybe one and your daughter was three. Right. So here you are. You've been given a rainbow baby. Your daughter's your rainbow baby, the baby that's been born uh, or is born after the loss of, of a child. Right. And you're still dealing with the grief of the first child. So to these people that say, oh, God will give you another one. You're just like, you don't understand. There's still a relationship that I had and the expectation that I had and the experience that I had that just not that that doesn't go away. There's nothing that will come and replace it, it doesn't it doesn't work like that people aren't fungible goods where they're just manufactured on an assembly line and you just reproduce you know the same uh the same product again so to speak but you are doing this with a family that's still growing how 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 did you make peace with that how did you say it's okay for me to be in this point where i miss my firstborn and I want to process that and I'm still grieving I'm working through that grief but I also welcome my heart and I have joy in my heart for my family that's grown since then? It was the hardest thing. <laughs> mm. It really was. Mm -hmm. I mean, the easiest answer is God. Um, but to think through the process, excuse me, and, cause it's not a but, and to think through the process, it, it was the hardest thing. Um, I knew that I wanted a baby. So I was like, I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna keep trying. Mm. But I didn't know how to go about it because my husband can tell you there was so much fear that we both had, even with trying for a new baby. And um, I remember reading a book. And I don't know why I can't remember the name, but um, it talked about having scriptures. And so I posted every scripture that talked about um, God. It is God's desire for us to have, you know, have a healthy baby. 
Um, so I posted every, I posted on every mirror, I posted it on every wall. Before I even, before we even conceived our baby, I touched my, my, my belly, I touched my body and said, you know, um, I, I read every scripture and I spoke, you know, I spoke the word over my body. I, I you know, because I, I had pastors, but most of them, all of them were men. And I said, they don't even know what's going on with my body. So I said, being a believer, I have to speak the word over my body. And so I literally did that. I said, because God, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to hear from you. And so thinking about people like Rebecca, you know, I, I thought about that and I said, it is God's will and that God will knit this baby in my womb. Mm. And, and, and just like, just like, I don't know what happened to, I mean, I do know with my first baby, they say he, his umbilical cord is what took his life. Um, I, I said, God is in control of this. And it was hard for me to do though. I mean, every day I cried, I said, God, I need you to, every day I cried, every day I prayed over the baby. And I just, I had to, you know, I said, cause God, I know you're in control. And, um, and so we were grateful. We we had our, our daughter, um, but every day she was, and I actually talk about that in the book, every day that she was a baby, we checked to see that she was breathing every single day, every single day. And my son, every single day. Even now, sometimes I go in, you know, it, it's just, I just know how fragile life is, but I think the defining moment for me to know that I could go on as I went to see, I went to see my great grandmother, Amy, and she knew what had happened to me. I had no, you know, because when this happens, you're not the same. I was not right. the same. And you know me when I was in college, I was like, eh, and I'm still like that. <laughs> but, but I will say, um, I, I, I had matured in a way that I, that, that I had, was not before. And I was a different person. My husband even says, you're not the same person. You know, literally he was like, I lost you, mm. but you're someone else now, mm. you know, but it took a long time to get to who I am now. Mm. But I, I, I know the, the, um, the genesis of that was when I went to see my great grandmother and she was 94 and I had lost the baby or she was in her nineties. And she said, you're gonna be all right. You know how they just give you that wisdom. She said, "You're gonna be all right, baby." And I was, I was just quiet, and I, I had because she knew I was so lively, and she was like, "This child has no life in her face." She said, "You're gonna be all right." She said, "You know how I know? Cause I lost a baby." And she talked, and, and as she as she told me about it, she talked about how she was chopping wood, and she was trying to take care of some of her children. And she was chopping wood and she described her her baby and described how he was moving. And she said, and she said she went into the house and she said, I wish I wasn't chopping that wood. And I thought to myself, this pain will never go. Like literally, it was like when I heard her say that, I said, she had, you know, she had, I think, four daughters, if I'm correct. Daddy, you tell me right. And um and, and she misses her baby and she was in her nineties. Wow. And I thought, this is something I just have to work through. And it is good. My son will always be a part of me because just like my grandma, she was talking about, she said he was a boy and all she had all daughters. And I thought it's going to affect me, but that doesn't mean I can't be strong. I said, if my great grandmother can go on and still be strong and raise beautiful daughters, I can do it too. And, and and I told her this before she passed, I was able to tell her, I said, that conversation we had, I hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what helped me. And um, so I realized it's it's a journey. And sometimes you you feel strong and sometimes you cry and it's OK. Right. It's right, OK. Right. And your daddy says five. Five. Yes. Five. 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 Yes. <laughs> so. I, I want to back up here because you said something that's so, what you just shared was just so important. Um, we talk about partnering with community here, partnering with self, partnering with God. 
but there used to be this bracelet. I don't know if it's still popular. I haven't seen one in a while, a long time ago, but you remember when the WWJD bracelets came out back in the day? What would yeah. Jesus do? I, I'll be honest with you. I was one of those people who would be so irritated by it. Because <laughs> I, I used to be like, that is like, oh, I get so irritated. By it. And the reason why is because I felt it didn't allow us to have human experiences. It just deified Christ or it made Christ you know, so spiritual that we were supposed to just stay in the spirit 24 seven when the Bible clearly says that the spirit and the flesh are always at war with one another. Mm -hmm. And I felt it just didn't give us the opportunity to be okay and to not feel guilty or ashamed about having human thoughts and a human experience. And I just really use it because, you know, I came to college, I had some grief going on myself. And I think maybe that's what irritated me about it because I was dealing with processing so much pain, hurt, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't want to talk to God. So seeing a WWJD mm. bracelet used to set me off. I'm like, <laughs> okay, whatever. All right, yeah. But I could not partner directly with God at the moment. My mother had brought me up in a word, so I thank God, so it was there. But I was mm -hmm. able to partner with community. I met other people who had similar experience. I, I, I was able to move forward. But you partnered with community. It was your grandmother's testimony that also provided you with some little, some, some, some form of liberation. Semblance. Yes, the semblance. <laughs> so I didn't want to say it, but the semblance and the freedom mm -hmm. to ex to know that it was going to be a lifelong or potentially be a lifelong process, and it was going to be okay to have that as part of your experience on this earth. Yeah, you because we're not that. When I, excuse me, I'm sorry. When I You're spoke positive. to my great grandmother, I thought about my grandmother on my mother's side and how she always talked about her baby who she had lost. And she and my it's like, you know, when you're younger and you hear this stuff, you don't process. I know I didn't process it. Right. And when she would talk about a baby, I was and I was just like a lot of other people, well, it's just a baby. See, I didn't have empathy right. until That's I had right. gone through that. Right. And you know, that generation, they didn't talk a lot about it. You know, and so but my grandmother would always talk about her daughter. And, and when she would talk about her children, she would always talk about my, my uh, mother's mother, uh, maternal grandmother. She would always talk about her daughter. And my brain literally went back to, oh, I understand. I get it now. I understand how she's in her 80s and 90s and she still talks about her daughter. I get it now. And that's why I talk about I, I'm a part of a society because if you're not a part of it it is sometimes hard or if you hadn't had a family who's gone through that sometimes it is hard and what people would say is oh it's just a baby you know um but you know at the same time you, you know you have that baby in utero and there's so much life during it um and then even the dreams die you know and the memories you never had fade and and it's that too, you know, and, and you look at the pictures and you only have these pictures, like you'll never have, like, I remember at the hospital, I was like, why are they taking this picture? You know, I was angry mm. when, when they took the picture of my baby and my husband said, you hold our baby. And I was so angry and I'm so glad I held him and kissed him, but I was angry, you know, I was like, why couldn't you just live, you know? You're and right. and I, I think about, that that's those are the only pictures we'll have and so it's all of that that dies you know right. and you have to find a way to 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 still go on wow wow i um i can appreciate all that you shared this far thank you so much um your husband you've mentioned his support throughout this process but do you have or have you guys had any conversations about what the process has been like for him. Do you talk about that? Because we talk about it from the female perspective, but can you offer some insight into your husband's perspective during this time and his process? Oh, absolutely. I have one, the poem circles where I do talk about his dreams and his hopes for being a good father and knowing that um, he was going to have a son. And, um, you know, we talk about it and, and I will say, you know, he always would say, I don't know. I don't know what you feel. I think he was really good about that. Like, I, I will never know what you feel. Like, I hurt because um, he was mine, but I'll never know what you feel. And I think I, I just appreciate that. Mm. Um, but yeah, we we cried 
you know, we have cried together. And, you know, some relationships, and we talk about it as a couple, we know some people who've literally gone through this and they're not married anymore. But somehow we have, by the grace of God and communication, we've grown closer through this. And, Amen. and um, you know, we visit our son's um, grave site and we, we talk to him, you know, um, and, and he he always talks about, you know, that um, what, he, what he wishes he would have been doing, but that he knows that he'll see him one day in heaven. And and um, but yeah, that, there's there's pain, definitely. And he he's gone through a lot with it. Um, but, you know, man, they, they try to be strong. And his thing was always trying to be strong for me. I would say the biggest way things may have manifested is that with our living children, he is very, very protective, very protective. And I remember him telling me, I just don't want anything to happen to our children because I don't know what would happen to you. Oh. I almost, he said, I almost lost you and I don't want to lose you. And so, so I know for him, it's all about making sure our, our living children are safe. Um, so yeah, those are the ways that I see it kind of manifest with him. That's awesome. True, a true covering that you have mm -hmm. a true covering. And it sounds like your husband has tons of wisdom. And I'm sure the fact that he's in relationship with Christ helps <laughs> as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a journey. You know, right, there's nothing, right. you know, it's a journey because we both have had our issues and I've gone to counseling repeatedly. You know, um, at one time I didn't really go, but I've had to go repeatedly because of just falling into depression with things and you know, he just has tried to be there for me because, like I said, sometimes you don't know what to say. You know, you don't know what to say. And, Carlo, I really appreciate the fact that you are so candid about how when, when an issue arises, you're very, you respond to it. You make a choice every time to work through things. And that is, you know, to me, the hallmark of, like, maturity and, 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 and just really just, I, I would speak testament to your strength and the power of God within you as well because you can always decide not to, but through you making that decision to move forward, you've been able to minister to so many other people. And, you know, I just want to say, I thank you for, for doing that. I thank you for choosing to push through what you're feeling. I thank you for being as candid and putting yourself out there um, and bringing this, this to uh, the attention of all who, who are watching this and, and who stumble across your page or have the opportunity to, um, you know, attend any of the functions you're, you're performing at or have gotten your CD because this is powerful. This is real. And this happens all the time. And we definitely need a platform where women can hear these stories and be encouraged by them. So, you know, I, I want to ask you, you know, what would you say? Because you say a lot in your books. <laughs> um, you know, but, <laughs> so what would you say to women who have had these similar experiences, you know, around losing a child um, at birth, you know, and they feel called to help others heal, others who've been who've gone through the same experience, you know, to help them heal, but they don't know how to make it happen. You know, what would you say to them? Well, first, thank you um, for that compliment. I, I would say, number one, is exactly what you said. It's a choice every day. Mm. Um, and I do have that poem, How to Mourn a Loss of a Baby. And maybe I can end with that. But um, I talk about it being a choice every day, mm. every day to choose life or choose death, every day. And so it's a conscious decision. I could wallow in my sorrow or I could make a decision to move on. And I think um, the biggest thing that I would say to people is, um, and, and not just women, the families that lose the babies um, or a child, um, use your gift. You know, whatever your gift is, use your gift and give back, you know, because it is so easy to I mean, it's, it's okay to be angry, but don't let the anger overtake you and overpower you to where you are not um, an active part of this life. Um, I remember there was a point in my life where I had to come to grips that I am not in control of my life. I, I'm mm. not, you know? And so something like this shakes you to the core and I think that's what you realize. You are not in control. You're not. And so, but what you are in control of is how you respond to it. 
And I remember there was a point where I had to say in the Bible, you know how it says everything works together for your good. And I had to accept, and it was the hardest thing. I had to accept that even that, like even the loss of my son has to work together for my good. And, and that was hard. And so I had to come to a place where I even had to say, thank you anyhow, Lord. And that's hard to do. And so there are moments where I do get angry with myself and I do cry I, and I still have guilt. And I have to say, well, oh, it happened for a reason because my husband will take me through it and say, well, you know, if this didn't happen, we wouldn't have had our daughter. We wouldn't have had our son. Mm. Th things wouldn't happen this way. And I say, you're right. You're right. Like he said, think about it. And I think about everything that's happened afterwards and how my son still gets to live on through everything. Like his small life has it right now, it, because of it, we're on this call right now. Because of it, I am able to connect with women and families and minister to them. Oh, because of it, you know, and so I would say use your gifts and use your your talents to uplift. And I think the more you give and pour into others, the more you're going to see even with yourself, you heal. Each time I speak to someone, I heal more. Even each time I encourage someone else is healing for me. Um, each time I read this book to someone or I um, or I minister or I hold a grief workshop, um, a writer's workshop or anything like that, I heal. Right. So that's that's good. Um, I think to sum up what you said about everything, because you made such great points. I can't I got to go back and listen to this and put the highlights up tomorrow. Girl. Let's go. Oh my <laughs> OK, um, and it's, um, it's what you said at the very beginning um, when we were talking about your change, your switch from being a STEM major to the, the, the performing arts or to an English major. And you mm -hmm. asked one simple question, God, what do you want me to do? And he showed you who you were at your core and how all of your experiences and who the direction and the road and the path you were supposed to take and those gifts that you had, you know, were there and what he wanted you to do with them. And so I thank you so kindly for encouraging others. I thank you so much for being an inspiration and just being willing to share and be candid. I would be remiss if I don't say what your father said. He said, Kay cannot come to us, but we can go to him. I am in, right. I'm going to enjoy meeting him for the first time in glory. Amen. 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 That's right. So we about to close it on out, sis. <laughs> and, and I want to know, like, what's coming down the pike for you? You know, how can we find your work? What is your website or your social media handles? Tell us all. Okay. Well, actually, I have um, I have a writer's workshop that I'm going to be holding. Um, it's actually called Writing that heals our grief and blesses our soul. So if anybody follows me, they know I always say bless your soul. Okay, cause I, they know that cause I have a, a song called bless your soul. Okay, all that right, everybody's right. like, everybody's like, that's my joint, that's my joint. Um, and I actually wrote that in college. I wrote it in college, but then I made it a song. And oh. um, and so yes, it's bless your soul. Okay, and, um, and so, I always have bless your soul at the end of everything I say. So this is a writer's workshop and it's about writing just like I just talked about, you know, through this year, we all have experienced grief right. through 2020, right. um, either through the loss of a job or through loved ones. I mean, unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. um, break in dreams. Right. And so um, I'm going to be holding a writer's workshop. It's going to be a two part workshop on March 20th and March 27th at five on Sunday, Eastern. And um, it's going to be a workshop where people can, um, you know, write from their hearts and um, I'll guide them through through it as a as a creative writing teacher. So um, it's a I, it's going to be on Zoom. So it won't be where um, you'll, you'll be able to be socially distanced and safe and it'll be virtual. So I'll be having that. And um, it's only thirty dollars per person. I, I want to have it be affordable so people could be a part of that. So that's coming up in the next two weeks. Um, I think that uh, next week uh, I'll be a part of a Women's History Month um, event um, sharing poetry. And um, actually, in the next few months, I will be um, launching my um, 
well, it's actually, it's not launched per se, but I'll be launching the website to my nonprofit um, power to power progeny. So it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I've really been um, doing that for 20 years. Um, and so I'll, I'll be doing that and I'm really excited about it. And, and I have all my books. Um, you guys heard about it. Semblance of a footprint. Um, I have my album, um, the book of my revelation and, um, oh, the Juneteenth book we talked about why we celebrate. And then I also have another book called Daring Dave. Yeah. Um, it's about a famous potter and poet, um, and um, African-American, um, and um, about history. So anybody can purchase anything at my website. Uh, it's my name uh, with no apostrophe, uh, Carla Lachelle Dawson.com. So yeah, you can follow me on social media. And of course, people can always join um, the Sinless of a Footprint um, Infant Loss um, group on Facebook. Awesome. And we'll be sure to put the website up as well, um, Carlo. So Listen, if you had the opportunity to sit in and listen to us today and join us, we thank you so much. But we definitely want to encourage you to go out and get these products. I mean, if not for yourself and for someone else, seriously, seriously, seriously. I know yes. I've known um, I've known individuals that have been uh, affected um, by the topic that we're talking about as well. And I, I like the fact that, Carlo, you speak to the fact that families have been impacted. It's just not one Absolutely. person. It's not one singular experience, but it touches the lives of all who were involved along the way. So I want to thank you so much for that. Miss Carlo, Michelle, Dawson, it's been yes. a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Our pleasure. So, you know, thanks to all of you for hanging up, hanging with us today. Uh, we'll see you throughout the week. Don't forget to follow us Kingdom Kinesis on Facebook, IG, and YouTube. Until then, remember you are essential to the kingdom of God. Be blessed and stay on the move. See you later. <laughs>